Good morning and welcome to the first session in MCC2 for Thursday. Uh, I'd like to introduce Hugh Fisher, a computer graphics uh, programmer and system administration who often works in Linux. Originally a real-time virtual reality developer, the post-avatar interest in 3D has led him to providing programming and technical support for a local 3D film company. Over to you, Hugh. So this talk's going to ramble a bit. If I start talking too fast, I'm told I do this some, from time to time, uh, wave at me to slow, or yell slow down. If you have a really quick question, sing out and I will repeat the question so it goes on the audio track. If you've got a really complicated question, you have to talk to Owen here about getting the radio mic. So, stereographic filmmaking in Linux. First of all, stereoscopic films. You may have noticed the past couple of years these have become really big. I uh, started with Avatar. It's now moved into TV sets. It's very difficult. It's 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 off, it. Looks okay on here. Crap. Uh, Tells 24 by 768. So, okay, we'll have to run it like that, I guess. <laughs> Sorry, where was I? Yeah. You might have noticed uh, 3D movies are very popular. Uh, you can't buy a TV set these days. It's not advertised as 3D capable. And it's something with terminal... Yep? One more thing. You might prefer quickly perhaps a bit closer to your mouth. Is that better? Ah, Joyce is even talks. <laughs> okay, so this was a terminology problem. GIMP and Inkscape. I traditionally thought of as 2D programs and later as 3D. And if you're a program at Cairo or actually it's 2D and OpenGL is 3D, but now we have this extra usage of 3D as stereoscopic film. So this talk, when I say something's 3D, I'm always talking about the stereoscopic idea that you present left and right, uh, different images of left and right eye, creating the illusion of uh, depth. And in CGI, this is really easy. You just have to render the uh, frames twice. You may have seen Pixar re releasing all their movies in 3D. And there's a free software solution for that, it's called Blender. They've got a pretty good stereo uh, workflow worked out. So you can do CGI uh, movies in 3D using Blender and other free tools. Now this is a picture I grabbed off the internet of a live action 3D camera. <coughs> this is uh, what's called a RED digital camera. They made a big splash by introducing digital cameras for filmmaking that only cost about $100,000. They've come down a bit, they're now about $50,000. Now for stereo, you need two of these. And you have a really big bulky rig. And for a recent example, David Attenborough has just put out his first 3D nature documentary. And it's about pterodactyls, you know, long extinct flying reptiles. And in the making of, he's asked, why did you do one about pterodactyls? And he said, well, a 3D camera, it weighs 50 kilograms, you need four people to operate it, it takes half an hour to change a lens. The only animal you can get near with uh, one of these things is going to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> and that's David Attenborough. He does not get shortchanged on equipment, and that's the best anybody could do for him. So, existing 3D cameras are expensive, they're bulky, they're inflexible, and they're expensive. I mean, you can work around the others. Uh, the fact that it's, uh, you need four people to carry a camera instead of one, it's a pain, but you can get around it. But expensive is a really big deal. So this is where I come in. Uh, my friends Winnie Yang and Nathan Clark, a uh, PhD student here at ANU, and a former PhD student who works at Silver Sun Pictures, they wanted to make a 3D short film. 
on a PhD budget, which is effectively zero. So for this project, they're my domain experts. If you're at the design talk yesterday, the uh, mention was made of personas, about how they made up people. So I was very lucky for this project that I had real people. You know, not some uh, ideal, abstracted 3D filmmaker. I'd, uh, I'd sort of uh, say, well, this is what I'm going to do. And they'd say, no, 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 we need this. So you can get real people, it's really good. Mm. So the first thing is this L-Foil camera. It's a full HD camera. It's a 90 20 by 1080 resolution. It's designed for streaming over Ethernet. We can record under hard disks or SD cards. Uh, they're very flexible. It's built around an embedded Linux board. Inside here is a little CPU with 40 meg of memory. And since I think it's really cool to show that off, I'll just, I'll just make sure my network is working. Yeah, so it's people. So this is the Internet of Things, the camera, can you suction Running Linux, so there's one CPU info. 40 megabytes of memory in a camera, which is unique HD video. Of course, the downside of the Internet of Things is I really should change the root password. You can figure this little camera by cleaning a web browser about it. Again, it's a camera and it's got a patchy or something inside it. And you can even see what's currently coming out of the camera. I'll just close it off for the rest of the talk. Another nice thing about the off-world camera, it's also been small, it can run off a battery. Or at least a battery of reasonable size. I mean, technically, you can run anything off a big enough battery. So, my friends Winnie and Nathan started building a stereo camera thing. It's called the Rig. It sh should really come up with a classy code name or something, but uh, at the moment, it's the Rig. Looks rather like uh, the robot out of short circuit. <laughs> but you can see here two Alpha cameras. The fact that they're nice and small means you can put them side by side at what's called for 3D filming the interocular distance. Uh, it's got supposed to match distance between human eyes. There's a bunch of network cables, there's a battery pack, and there's a little laptop. So that's going to run all the configuration, it's going to take uh, care of the recording. And there's a viewfinder and some shoulder straps which you can't see there. So it weighs about 7 kilos, it can be operated by one person, although quite, quite often it's useful to have a second person fiddling with a laptop. It's controlled by a great piece of software called Alpha Vision. A guy called Sebastian Pickelhofer wrote this. I hope I pronounced his name right. It's a Java graphical user interface program for controlling an Alpha camera. It's got a nicer interface than the web pages, because after all, the web pages are a user interface designed by embedded system engineers, and they're really not too good at it. So it's a very nice little Java program. It's fully free software. And it's got controls that work together. The web, you can do everything through the web interface, but it, it gets clunky. You have to remember if I set this, and I also need to set that and do this and the other. This, those are about useful combinations for filmmakers. Originally, it was written for a single Alpha camera. Uh, Witty and Nathan hassled him, and he wrote some nice stereo config options. For instance, if you've got two cameras, you obviously want them to start recording at exactly the same time. <coughs> or if they don't start at the same time, tell you what the delay between them is. And it's not a real-time recording software, it's a configuration software. You run Alpha Vision, set up your camera saying, I want this frame rate, I want the file stored on this hard disk, I want you to use this resolution, and then you go. Now, so far, I haven't had anything to do with this. I can't take any credit for any of this. Where I came in is uh, to do stereo filming with two cameras, there's a bunch of uh, uh, configuration you need to do that you don't do with a regular camera, as well as focus and brightness and depth of field and all the stuff regular photographers worry about. You have the interocular eye separation distance, because you play games with how far apart the, uh, the cameras are to enhance or reduce the stereo effect. And there's a toe-in parameter which has the same effect. Good filmmakers, like James Cameron when they do Avatar, create the illusion that you're looking through the screen into another world. And that's by very careful adjustment of all the 3D parameters. Not so good filmmakers do it in post-production and you end up with Clash of the Titans. 
So to do this, you need a real-time stereoscopic preview. You want to be able to see the stereo image, that's both left and uh, right eye images, as you're adjusting the camera. So you can say, bit wider, bit narrower, move it, toe in, whatever. And this is where I come in. In a uh, previous era, the Australian National University here had a virtual reality theatre. And I was lucky enough to be a programmer on this project, which means I know how to do stereoscopic 3D in OpenGL. And I'd worked with the School of Art here on a couple of artistic projects, not stereoscopic ones necessarily. So Winnie and Nathan sort of, oh, we need a, somebody who can write a 3D program for us. We'll get Hugh. And this is where I come in. So, so I have a problem. We have two video streams. Each of them is high definition video, 1920 by 1080. It's what's called raw bio format. I'll explain that in a little while. You've got to decode this to RGB format and display in stereo. And for stereo display, I use good old red blue glasses. If you're going to do 3D, this is actually a really good option because it works with every display on the market. There are very few laptops that are stereo capable with using shutter glasses or polarized glasses or those weird things, uh, whatever they give you in a cinema. Every computer in the world will work with red blue stereo glasses. And if you want to try this out, you get the glasses at a comic shop. I thought these might be sort of a obsolete technology, you know, these, didn't these die out in the 1950s or something? No. I went at a local comic shop, Impact Comics and Civic, said, can you get me 3D uh, you know, red blue glass? And they sure, how many do you want? I had them under the counter. Okay, let's look at bio format. This is the internal sensor arrangement used by most digital cameras. You can see there's a 4x4 four four grid. It's got one red sensor, one blue sensor, and two green sensors. Apparently, the human eye is most sensitive to levels of green. So this is the raw format that comes out of your camera. And of course, there are only so many ways you can uh, permute these four sensor elements, and different camera manufacturers have managed to do all of them. <coughs> And Kodak have come up with uh, yet another format where it's a 3x3 grid, oh joy. <laughs> but I'm not working with that one yet. I don't want to. Now, decoding in uh, by a format in real time is not really possible with current CPUs unless you're willing to do a really crappy job. Fortunately, it's a parallel processing problem, and that's tailor-made to run on a GPU. So I dug up uh, this paper, uh, Morgan Maguire Williams College. Uh, I'm sorry I haven't cited it quite correctly. It's a really good algorithm for debayering or demosaicing uh, into an RGB image. It requires an uh, OpenGL Class 2 GPU or Shader Model 3. And they're everywhere. They came out in 2005. Uh, my phone has a could run this code. Okay. Now I needed a library to put together this application, uh, and it was GStreamer. This is what the Alpha Vision people were already using to record uh, video sessions. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, it's a multimedia framework for Linux, and there are a couple of those around. It's based on glib and gobject, so technically it's part of GNOME, but it's not good. I like it. It is a really good example of Unix sort of modular design theory applied to this. So instead of a monolithic system, it's a bunch of little components. You can plug them in, you can extend them, and you can do nifty stuff on the command line. And I do like to demo this because it's uh, very cool. Uh, yeah. Please work. I'll talk about the text that prints out. Uh, yep. In my checklist, I put on the notes the first couple of times I set up this uh, talk demo, I've got a completely black screen. I eventually realized this because I forgot to take the lens cap off. <laughs> so let's have a look at this command line. So I'm using GSC launch. At the time I was doing development, uh, GSC was officially version 0.1. Version 1.0 finally came out like last year, I haven't updated to it. Yeah. So the other is, it's like a command line, in fact, it's basically a pipe using exclamation marks instead of vertical bars. 
So it's part of the source, the source in JStreamer, someone who generates video or audio. But that's sort of multimedia framework. You can probably do any kind of real-time processing with JStreamer. It's that flexible. <coughs> and the other is part of my new sync, which just consumes data. So if you have traditional live multi-process, it's actually not producing consumers. And here I'm using XD image sync, which is a very simple little plugin that just takes uh, images that come in and, and feeds them into a So you don't need to write around custom gear if you want to. You just plug it into an existing one. My source is an RCSP source. Back in the 1990s, the Internet Engineering Task Force designed a UDP protocol called RTP, real-time protocol, specifically for doing video and audio. Now, the problem is, in the modern world, the firewalls and access lines, if you don't know about HTTP, you don't get used. So RTSP is basically RTP stuffed into a TCP stream that can be done over HTTP. RTP JPEG DPEG is uh, just uh, <coughs> taking the RTP stream. This is what's uh, I call a low-level component in G stream. It does a very simple function, just one thing. RTP comes in, JPEG payload comes out. Then it's JPEG decoder thing. Again, it's converting. JPEG comes in, uncompressed RTP comes out. Then the cube just provides a buffering in the source. And here's a really interesting uh, component, FFMP cost space. How many people have actually programmed with MPEG out of curiosity as opposed to just in the utility? Good, yeah. Uh, anyway, I found it pretty hard when I was working with it. Was that Yeah. So the fact about DStreamer is a whole bunch of wrappers around FFMPEG, so you get all the functionality of FFMPEG, which is amazing, and you don't have to learn the C API and just use these components. This is also a high-level component. It's a negotiator. So it doesn't have a specific input type or a specific output type. What it's doing is asking the components on either side what you want and what do you provide. So there's a video scaler, which is the next in the pipeline. FFMPEG color space asks it, what's your preferred format? Do you want RGB, you want YUV, whatever. It goes back and asks Q, what are you providing? And the Q in this case is just to say, well, I'm providing whatever JPEG is. Which we so if the color space then says, well, okay, by JPEG coming in, be a source on type of I'll convert from one to the other. So again, GStream is a great way, using these high-level uh, components, to just say, convert this into something that this will accept. Couldn't be saying else about GStream. Ah. So that's a uh, text summary, but let's talk about. Another point is, I uh, should have mentioned, it's zero copy, zero copy internally. GStreamer just passes pointers uh, to memory buffers. The slight downside of this is everything's running in the th same address space, so if one of them crashes, it can sort of mangle everything else. But high performance, you need to do that with video. So my initial, my initial idea was, I'll just write a new component that fits in this GStreamer plugin. <coughs> Debayering is really expensive on a CPU. My laptop, which is uh, an Intel Core i5, it's not a wimpy, but it can't do real-time debayering. Now, for existing filmmaking procedures using the off-world camera, that wasn't a problem. You just record the uh, bio data. Later on, you run through a post-processing step and uh, take however many hours it needs to convert to nice RGB. For this, had to do it in real-time. So a camera sends RTSP over Ethernet. And my initial idea was that I'd write this DBayer plugin. It would send the data over to the GPU, translate it into RGB, send it back. That way, I'd have a nice universal plugin. You know, I could contribute it to the GStreamer toolkit. It'd be use usable by other applications. Problem is that once uh, you've done this copy, it gets sent to the application, which in this case is doing a stereo preview, and it sends it straight back to the GPU, which is kind of inelegant. And you're actually talking about quite a lot of data here. 1920 by 1080 HD video is 2 megabytes in Bayer format, and it's 6 megabytes by the time you get to RGB. So that's a lot of data to throw around. So, new plan is I'm going to write a custom viewer app. It's going to be a GStream of sync. It's going to take raw Bayer inputs. It's going to do conversion of RGB, display and stereo, all in one operation. One of my development tools, uh, once I sort of worked out what I'm going to do, I decided to use Python as my programming language. If you already uh, use Python, you know why, it's great. If not, eh. It may seem an odd choice to use a high-level Python-like language for a high-performance video processing, but remember that Python is not doing the heavy lifting. All the hard work of dec uh, decoding the RTSP and converting JPEGs or whatever, that's been done by GStreamer components. They're written in C and uh, or assembler even in a fast. All the hard work of doing the debayering stuff from Bayer format to RGB is going to be done on the GPU that's written in GL shading language. That's fast. So the Python is acting more as a traffic cop. It's just steering stuff around. I decided to use WX widgets for the GUI and it was basically because I already knew how it worked and this was being developed in a hurry. And OpenGL shading language, well, it's obligatory if you're going to do GPU programming. 
you can't write the stuff in C or C++ or whatever, you have to learn a shading language. So I ended up using an organic or spiral development process. I'm not uh, big on test-driven uh, development for this kind of project because so much of it depends on the end users. You can't really write end user tests uh, for your code. So I started with a very simple little program, can I create a G-stream of pipeline from Python? Because after all, if that couldn't happen, I was going to have to rethink my development language. Then we moved on, can I create a G-stream component from WX Python? Then I started working in the application framework and just started with PNG files. And that was useful because I could then take it to my domain experts and say, imagine this was actually your video series, would it be useful to you? Fortunately, everything worked, and I was pleased to find that GStreamer it meets the criteria that simple things are simple to do. I didn't have to write dozens or hundreds of lines of code just to get, say, a basic audio component up. And the hard things to do, they're possible without too much work. Now, part of this had to write a GStreamer component. Now, because they're G objects, this means you get to subclass existing templates. And the docker for GStreamer isn't great. It's sort of occupational disease of open source projects as everybody's too busy coding and to write any. But there are some nice uh, example codes. Yeah. Let's have a look at uh, components. Because it's a G object, you are writing a whole lot of boilerplate. And this is because after all, G object is doing object oriented programming in plain C. Now, my first reaction, since I had worked with G before, is why are we using C, something like that? Now, it's true that this kind of code is a bit tedious, but I realize now that it actually makes everything far more flexible. And G objects can introspect, in the sense of all these uh, properties, all the methods that, because they're defined explicitly through the C stuff, other programs can ask them what they are. It turns out that writing a Python wrapper for a G uh, stream component is really easy, much easier than normally writing Python extensions to C. You just need a generic piece of Python code that's given the uh, banner library says, what objects do you use, what properties do you have, and what types they are? Oh, you've got an integer, it's called video source site. Oh, you've got a parameter, you've got a method that does this. So it's very easy to integrate these G objects into any language you like Python, Ruby, JavaScript, for all I know. So now, every time I bundle myself, this is tedious, I realize it's an amplifier. G objects are actually more useful to people writing in other languages than any C object would be. Okay, getting on to the GL side. This is an uh, area I think most Linux apps are going to start shifting to OpenGL for the rendering engine simply because most of the frameworks have and really OpenGL is about all you need these days. It does 2D graphics, does 3D graphics. Now the problem is that a GL context is how you do everything in OpenGL and it doesn't matter whether you're programming on a Mac or Windows or Linux you end up with this equivalent object. And in the old days it was easy, it was like a canvas or an extrawable, it was just a basically a window on the screen, a block of memory you wrote into it. These days, though, modern GPUs are best thought of as a loosely coupled asymmetric multiprocessor. It's a real CPU, it's got branches and exceptions and scheduling and all the rest of the stuff. It's got its own address space and you're communicating with this thing through a kind of descriptor. And because we haven't really caught up on uh, this sort of new model of what a GPU is, Geocontext, the objects through which we program, are not thread safe, and this causes all kinds of problems, which I'll now present. So, my first application design got two G streamer pipelines, one per camera. The application was going to create its open geocontext. After all, that's where I'm going to display the data, so it's going to pass those to the components and say, when you decode the bias stuff, put the RGB image here. Every t and it would do that every time a frame came in. And in my test program, which had exactly one frame of data, a PNG image, it worked fine. Now the problem is, in a modern GUI, you've got an event loop. You don't actually write a, a sort of traditional main program. Instead, the, the event loop is the main program. And every so often, it will call your code and say, you can execute now. And that's not unique to GNOME, it's uh, how Windows works these days, it's how MacOS, MacOS works. Which is okay for most purposes, but not if you're doing video or audio processing. Because after all, if video data is coming in, you've got hard real-time schedules to meet. 
you can't wait for some event loop to decide, yes, you can execute now. So all the GStreamer pipelines are setting up their own little threads and running them by themselves. So on the left here, we have a bunch of frames come in. We've got a GStreamer pipeline in executing repeatedly. And every software is going to try and copy data of an incoming frame to the GL context, which actually means send it onto the GPU. On the other side, we've got the event loop. And every so often that's going to say, well, I need to display uh, something to the user for which I need the GL context. And you can see where this is going. <laughs> it crashes badly. Uh, go back. What I discovered, annoyingly, was that uh, there's a call you use in OpenGL programming to acquire a GL context. And it's supposed to say, Either it's uh, returned true, yes, you can use this context, or false, no, you did, I couldn't acquire that context. So I'd written my pipeline on the assumption that every so often I'd fail to acquire the context, I'd just have to wait and try again. This turned out not to work because instead it crashed. I'm not sure what's going on. One of the downsides of using Python and GStreamer and so on is there's so many different threading models going on, I can't figure out who's doing what. <laughs> Occupational hazard. So instead of uh, failing to occasionally copy a frame over, it was crashing. So version 2, I came up with this thing called the idle callback. If you're using GNOME, GTK, which WX Widgets is built on top of, you're allowed a one-shot callback next time the event loop executes. And you inserting these callbacks is thread safe. So another thread can ask the event loop, when you've got a moment, execute this for me. So new design, the pipeline stuffs the frame, incoming frame into a buffer, tells the event loop, call this piece of code for me. If that sounds confusing, well, it is. I tried to draw a diagram of it. So the frame comes in, pipeline stuffs the frame into a data, uh, buffer. It's got this piece of copy code. It does not actually execute it. Instead, it passes the copy function and the pointer to the data buffer over to the event loop and says execute this when you get a chance. Ideally, within the next 10, 15 milliseconds or whatever, the event loop says, okay, goes away and executes my copy code, which uh, transfers data to the GL context. Now, one of the nice things about doing talks is that my, they make you revise your assumptions. My original notes to accompany this slide said, yeah, it looks a bit convoluted, but uh, this is how modern GUIs work. And I thought, you know what? This is a really ugly hack. This is just a ridiculous way of working. And I think it's something that uh, GUI frameworks have to work out, that we're not in a single thread, single processor era anymore. We've got these multi-core processors, zillions of cores all over the place. We've got to find a better way to do this. So while this works, um, in retrospect, I'm not so proud of it. <laughs> okay, buffer contention. You may have noticed in that diagram, it's possible for a new frame to arrive while the callback is executing. Now, I didn't put any, any locking on this or scheduling or queuing. So what's going to happen if these two events coincide? I mean, we're copying two megs of data. It can't be done in an uninterrupted operation. And the answer is the buffer contents get mixed up and you get a visual glitch. Now, any kernel programmers in the audience are probably blacklisting me for life now from ever working on anything important. But wait, this is a real-time 3D program. In real-time graphics, whether it's video games or simulations, or in this case, showing a video frame, frames are disposable. They get flashed on the screen for a 60th of a second, and then they're gone. They're not being recorded. This is not the application that records the frames for the end user. This is just showing you, the same. if uh, one frame glitches, so what? You throw it away. So this is standard real-time practice. I would not recommend it, though, for, as a general practice. And the last thing I had to do was write a GPU shader, or rather, since I'd found that a neat paper, copy the GPU shader code out of the paper and make it run. Okay, there's sort of two levels of GPUs on the market right now. There's the OpenGL 2 or Shader Model 3. They have vertex and fragment shaders. They're available for phones. They're available for Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. They're available for Macs. They're available for desktops. 
even you know a notebook with crappy Intel integrated G, uh, GPU can handle that kind of stuff. The other generation, which just came out about a year ago, Shader Model 5, are very powerful, very advanced, and a little hard to get used. Now I want to show a shader here because some people think that those sort of shaders are mystical magic things. It, uh, certainly I did when I started, but they actually turn out to be pretty easy. So vaguely written, uh, of course not, it's not readable because it's on the wrong side of the screen. So looking at the syntax of this thing, GL shading language, it's uh, basically C with uh, vector and matrix types. You'll notice good old CPP, the C preprocessor, it's still there, it's still being used. And the code itself, it, it looks like C or C++, and that's deliberate. You have to learn a few new rules, but it's really quite simple. One of the best things about writing shaders is you're not writing a complete program. The more, there's a whole bunch of scheduling and organizing of data and so on, but you don't have to worry about that. The GPU driver does it for you. This is a very simple little program. It takes a pixel in, it puts a pixel out. So if you haven't tried GPU shaders, I recommend you do so. It's easier than you might think. One last point, by adding GLSL to the mix, you'll now see that I've now got three programming languages in use. I'm writing in Python, I'm writing in C, and I'm writing in GLSL. Now, that I think is just the way the future is. That this 21st century, multilingual programming is the way to go. These specialized languages are all around us. You're just more productive if you can work in more than one language at the same time. I'd also point out there's a lot of frameworks. Even though this little application adds up to about a thousand lines of code, I've got uh, GNOME Framework and WX Widgets and GStreamer and an OpenGL driver. And it's traditional for programmers of my age, you know, grey head, say, ah, oh, back in the 1980s, you could uh, program right on the machine and you knew how everything worked. Again, that's not going to happen. Those days are gone. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and speaking as a 3D programmer, the 1980s sucked. And the 1990s uh, weren't much better. So actually, I'm glad to have all these modern frameworks. And yes, it makes life a bit more complex in some ways, but you can do so much more. <coughs> so finally, success. The program, which I haven't demonstrated, because uh, for best effect, you really need two cameras, and I've only got one of them. Nathan and Winnie built the rig. Sebastian uh, put this uh, stereo config stuff in Alpha Vision. The little stereo cam check program I wrote proved to work with two cameras, so it was always fun. Uh, they used that to create a short 3D film. Uh, it was shot entirely in Canberra. It may have been the first 3D film in Canberra, I like to think so. I would like to say it was also been screened, but the filmmaker got seriously ill afterwards, and that hasn't happened yet. Okay, now pulling back, trying to make this more general. That was my project. Is anybody else interested in this stuff? And it turns out, yes. There's a community called Apertus. They're really big on free, in both the Grati and Lieb sense, of software and hardware for filmmakers. So they run a software repository. Alpha Vision is based there. Stereo Camcheck is based there. Used to be SVN. Now it's uh, GitHub. They get contributors from Germany, which I think is where Sebastian is, from Brazil, from Australia, not just me. There's some people in Sydney working on this. They took their prototype sort of uh, free camera and Alpha version and Stereo Cam Check to the Pre Arts Electronica 2012, which was in Geneva last year, and they were given a prize. And it's a fairly major electronic arts festival. So Blender has shown that you can make uh, full 3D feature films from start to finish using only free software and hard, uh, hard, sorry, using only free software. The Apertus people, their goal is to demonstrate that it should be possible to do the same with live action all the way from uh, filming. So they're trying to get people to develop uh, software tools for converting post-processing, <coughs> video editing, all the complex stuff that filmmakers have to do and currently they buy Macintoshes for. 
So on stereo cam check, I've got this uh, major to-do list of thing. There's a color shifting bug that when you move the windows, sometimes the colors in the image get swapped. So red becomes green and green becomes blue. GStreamer 1.0 has come out. Now, a big thing in GStreamer 1 is that they've introduced uh, GPU components. So they're trying to set up a standard framework for copying data between pipelines and between pipelines and GPUs. And that would get around the problem I had. There's got to be a uh, way to, better way to compress by a data. Uh, anyway, software projects are never finished. So uh, it's traditional sort of say, this is what I learnt, or this is what I want you to uh, take away from this talk. So as far as programming goes, multilingual programming is the way uh, to go. Learn C, learn Python, learn GLSL. GPUs are everywhere. It's worth learning about them. And GStream is really nice. And to wrap up, uh, should thank uh, Winnie and Nathan for bringing me in on this project. It's uh, very informative. Elfall.com, they're the people who make this camera. They're, they're very Linux friendly, obviously. Not only are they using Linux in their camera, but they give you the source code, they give you the tools to update it, uh, they give you kits. They're really good people to work with. And Aphesus.org, which is uh, where you find all these people who want to do free tools for filmmakers. And I have to say, Apertus, at the moment, I think there's more enthusiasm than technical ability. And that sounds harsh, but I think it's true. And if you're a programmer and you're interested in working on this kind of stuff, on interesting projects, they could really use your help. And that's it. Thanks, Hugh. We'll take some questions. So just put your hands up so I can. Oh, good. Thanks for that. Um, would you mind repeating what a shader actually does? What the okay uh, on the GPU, there's two kinds of shaders. At least uh, for the simple one, vertex shaders handle geometry. So you send in triangles or quadrangles or whatever your shape is. Think of them as vector graphics, kind of stuff that comes out of Inkscape, and you can uh, translate them or distort them or transform them. Fragment shaders or pixel shaders take individual pixels. They come in and you can do whatever you like to that pixel. You can't actually move it on the screen, but you can change the colour space. You can uh, look up a table and translate it. You can do colour blending. You can convert colour images to grayscale. All those uh, super duper effects you see uh, just these days in, a, in the GIMP or Photoshop, they're all done with shaders. So anything you can do, pixel comes in, another pixel comes out. That's it. Sorry, hog the mic. I had one more question. Would you mind showing us? You mentioned it didn't take very much Python to hook up to that G object stuff. Could you have that the piece that hooks up to that? that you could just yeah, yep. quickly show us. This is a very simple little Python library I wrote. It's just doing a boilerplate stuff. You can see that uh, compiling a shader, just taking a piece of code from a file, it's uh, half a dozen lines, and most of those lines are actually filling out uh, where, the, where the text comes from. All the real work is done here. Compile a shader, did it work? You also have to what's called link a shader. Did it work? Half a dozen lines of code. Uh, more gstvideo.py. This is the stuff that actually does useful things with it. So here's code that uh, creates a fragment shader from a file. You can see it's just a couple of lines because I've already written it. When I want to use the shader, I need one line of code, Jill. That this, uh, I'm just inserting this little filter, as I said. They're not complete programs. They're little kernels, is I think the word, if you've done signal processing. Pixel comes in, pixel comes out. It's more like a function. Yeah. Um, unrelated question. When you're doing the 3D display, are you displaying alternate frames or alternate lines, or how are you interleaving the, the two sets of video? 
uh, RGB glasses. So the red and uh, red yeah, pixels are I, one I, eye, I understand how it works for the eyes. I'm wondering how you're doing it from the camera to the display. Are you displaying 30 frames from one and 30 frames from the other interleaved, or are you trying to merge the frames in uh, some manner? Merge. That's what you do with red, green, blue. Is uh, it's it's merged in colour space. So I convert the red, green, blue from the left eye into a grey value, and then I copy that. Uh, so you're doing two sets of debarring and then interleaving the frames you're getting. Uh, hang on a sec. This is the actual uh, code here. So for a given eye, I calculate the grey value. It's, uh, it's more like polarised rather than shutter glass. So shutter glass stereo goes alternate left, then right, left, then right. Polarised displays at the same time and separates by polarisation. Red, green, blue, you overlay two frames. One of them is only right, written to the red, and red pixels of the frame buffer. The other image is written to the green and blue pixels of the frame buffer. So when you view the information, the red filters out one eye and the green and blue filters out the other. It sounds uh, more complex than it really is. Red, green, blue stereo is very easy to write. Yeah. Then I understand it was how I mm. held that um, Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've just about run out of time. And uh, with all our guest speakers, we have a presentation from LCA 2013. Keep your project warm. And thank Hugh for his excellent presentation.